1987, the G.I. Joe toy line was undergoing a reboot of sorts. Keeping in mind that it was an unprecedented five years ongoing and Hasbro felt the old toy continuity would alienate the next generation of kids. It's always been my contention that the Battle Force 2000 team was never meant to stand side by side with regular G.I. Joes, but showed what G.I. Joe would become 13 plus years into the future. The prototype name for this sub-team was Future Force after all, and could have been more than just a catchy title, but a literal description of them. I assume the story and taglines for the sub-team of Joes got changed to integrate them into the present, a last minute change which accounts for the upset release dates, but their antagonists, the Iron Grenadiers, didn't get the memo. For part 3 in my series of Battle Force 2000 reviews, I'm going to be taking a look at the Eliminator four-wheel drive Jeep and its driver, Blocker, and the Vector Jet with its pilot, Maverick. I'll start with the Vector's armaments first. It has two thin cannon barrels underneath the nose. They don't move or recoil or anything. They are just a bit wobbly just because of the construction, however. On each of the rear winglets, we also have some more cannons sticking out, long thin cannons, which I do have to warn you that they are fairly easy to snag on things, so be careful with that because once they do snag on something, they tend to snap off fairly easily because of their thinness. On the back of the vehicle, we have a turret whose twin cannon barrels move up and down in sync, and the turret itself can move around. It's only stopped because of the very large hinge here. And finally on the underside, we have four of these missiles. The missiles are all the same design. The missiles themselves are, well, kind of hollow looking to be perfectly honest. They're hollow all the way around. Seems a bit cheap. And as I'm down here, Time to show off the features of the Vector Jet, starting off with the landing gear. All three of the landing gears have very small plastic wheels, not very detailed, but they do fold up flush to the bottom. Very nice. And on the back, the canopy opens up via that hinge. And inside the turret, there are handholds for the gunner, as well as an extremely detailed surface area. We have two removable panels to show off engine detail. The detail is actually mirrored on the other side. And finally, we have an opening canopy And there's lots of control surface detail, but sort of crammed to the sides of the seat here. As you can see, however, despite the fact that this is a well-detailed, kind of a long-looking seat, the figure was still crammed in there, which is one of the negatives of the Vector Jet. In order for Hasbro to keep the Vector Jet at the same price point as the rest of all the Battle Force 2000 vehicles, which was in under $10, Kind of this kind of the average price point for all the medium sized vehicles in the GI Joe range anyway at the time. They kind of shrunk the vector. And while normally what Hasbro would do is they would actually tweak the proportions and make the uh, canopy portion a little bit larger than normal. I think the 1993 Ghost Striker was kind of like that. However, they kept the proportions, making it a very beautiful looking sci fi jet. Unfortunately, the compromise was that you have to cram the figure in here. And now for the Vector Jet's second mode, what you do is you pull the back turret out straight like this. And now the turret is its own separate gun pod. 
Without the Vector's turret, or gun pod as it is now, the missing section doesn't really make the Vector look like it's missing anything. It's already a very swoopy design and that looks kind of like just the conclusion to that end portion of the craft. The nice thing about not having the gun pod there, however, is that you can just sort of rest the Vector upright on its thrusters, like it's a rocket ready to take off. By itself, the gun pod doesn't do anything that it didn't do when it was attached to the Vector. I'll just open up the canopy just to show you what a figure looks like sitting in here. And he has quite a bit more room to be posed in there than poor old Maverick had in the canopy of his own vehicle. Closing this all up, one very interesting addition that we didn't need to use when it was attached to the Vector is the fact that the base can actually swivel independent of the main body of the gun pod. Meaning that you get the illusion that this thing is actually moving around. Even though you don't really kind of need that, you can just kind of spin it like this and just use your imagination that it's kind of spinning around. But it's cool that the bottom portion actually can stay put with the rest of the entire gun pod swiveling around. In order to return the gun pod to the Vector Jet, it's just as easy as it was pulling it out. You just have to line this raised ridge, which is on the center of the base here, with the seam line, which is on the inside here. It's fairly easy if you just kind of line it up on the outside here like this. And once it's all even, you're pretty much guaranteed that it is in place and you can just snap it in. The Vector pilot, Maverick, whose code name is obviously inspired by the movie Top Gun, comes with two accessories. The first is a removable helmet. As you can see on the original card artwork, he would have had a red clear visor across the opening of his helmet. I kind of wish they had kept that in it looks like the same type of a red thing which would have been over Knockdown's helmet, which they removed as well. Honestly, it would have given the entire outfit more of an airtight feeling, more like a space suit. And speaking of his suit, you can see a little extra detail on here, which I'll get to in just a moment. Finally, he comes with what the contents list on the card calls, and I'm not kidding about this, a semi-automatic machine pistol. Now this is a message to anyone out there who uses gun lingo without being informed, or at least only being informed by their own opinions. If you don't understand what gun lingo means, please don't use it. Semi-automatic and machine pistol are two words which should not go together. A machine pistol infers fully automatic at some point, or at least a burst shot. I mean, semi means half of something and fully means all of it. It's rather obvious. Sorry about the rant. Now on to the figure. I actually do like the way that Maverick here looks. He looks less like a pilot and more like what the 1950s thought the future of the space race would look like. He really does look like your typical spaceman in a 1950s B-movie. Especially with this uh, silver chess piece with the flared pointy shoulder bits. The silver, white, and blue really do go very well, and he does have a little bit of army green on here, but it's really very subtle here. One very nice thing about the details on the figure, which might be a little bit hard to see. On one hand, I kind of wish they were picked out in paint, but on the other hand, I could see that the original card artwork kind of didn't have that either. But you can see little lines here and there on his suit. And it looks like circuitry. If you're looking for Maverick, or the Vector Jet, or both on the aftermarket, like I've said before, all Battle Force 2000 vehicles are fairly cheap and very easy to find on the aftermarket. And the Vector Jet was no exception. There are a few things that you do have to look out for though. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this review, the cannons on both the Gun Pod and the 4 on the Vector Jet are really very thin and can snap if you're, <laughs> if you're not careful handling them or if you snag them on something. It does have four missiles, which 
might be easy to lose. And for some strange reason, I've seen on the aftermarket a number of vector jets with one or a couple of the landing gear missing. They're just held in by these little kind of a embedded C-clip type deal, so it's not really that hard to pop them out. I'm not really sure why they would, because mine seem to be really very secure, but like I said, I'm just reporting what I've seen on the aftermarket. As for the figure itself, he's a very, very easy figure to find complete with all of his parts on the aftermarket. The only thing you really do have to look out for is, like a lot of figures with white plastic, he tends to yellow, so that's really the only thing that you have to worry about. Of course, all you have to do is just take your time and restore them with some hydrogen peroxide, however. And now for the Eliminator four-wheel drive Jeep. I'm going to start with the armaments. Starting off with these lasers, which seem to be mounted to where the headlights would normally go. Then they swivel side to side independently, but they don't have a whole lot of range, as you can see here. There's another gun mounted asymmetrically on the driver's side, which can rotate all the way around but it is hindered by the roll cage that it bumps into. One very odd thing about this gun, however, is that there's a big hole in it, almost as if there was a ammo box or ammo belt supposed to plug into there, but the toy never came with anything like that. And finally, at least in this mode, we have a rear-mounted, swiveling, double-barreled cannon. It can swivel all the way around, unencumbered, and it has two foot pegs on the back, so you can add a gunner if you don't wish this to be computer controlled or controlled by the driver. And it swivels all the way up, but it doesn't swivel down. There's actually a stopper within the hinge here, so this is as far down as it will go. One very interesting thing, however, is that this thing really reminds me of the 1982 HAL laser cannon. This is almost like a miniature version of it, which is really cool. As for the features of the Eliminator Jeep, we have your standard universal tow hook. And back here we have a rear-facing back seat, meaning that this is a fourth way to control this one cannon. We have plenty of detailed surface controls here, as well as this one joystick on that side, and a monitor with a little keyboard on here, which, if your figure is sitting back here, cannot possibly reach, but, you know, it's the thought that counts, I suppose. We also have some stairs leading up to this area, which is a very nice little bit of reality, which quite a few G.I. Joe vehicles and play sets unfortunately forget to do. And there's also one foot peg here, so you can have a figure just kind of hanging off the side here. Unfortunately, right here, we do not have a steering wheel for the driver, but we do have these joysticks and some sculpted in detail. That more than makes up for that. And we also have a rather rigid roll cage for the figure, which makes it a little bit hard for you to get a figure in and out of here, but at least the figure is secured. It kind of looks like it would have been kind of like a, a pivoting point here because these are just kind of um, pegged in right here, but unfortunately this one is permanently stuck in here, so this uh, does not rotate out of the way. Now to me, this is the most interesting feature of the Illuminator Jeep, that it actually does have steerable wheels. Now I know what you're saying, the 1985 Awestriker had that first, and once you turn it into a certain position, it actually kind of locks the steering in place. I know what you're saying again, the 1986 Thunder Machine actually did that. But this is something that which is unique just to the Illuminator Jeep you can turn the rear wheels as well. And this also means that you could use the rear-facing back seat as the driver's seat, actually playing with this toy in reverse by using the rear wheels as the front steering wheels. And now for the Eliminator's second mode. This entire blue section can be lifted up and out like a tonneau cover on a really small pickup truck. As a matter of fact, the whole lip here is actually sort of friction fit on here. However, as you can see here on the steps, on the very top step, there is actually one little knob there. And while that doesn't really lock the whole thing into place, it is something that you might want to just sort of uh, get up and out first to make the whole thing easier to pull off. And now this thing looks quite a bit more like a really tiny pickup truck, 
but it reveals so much more. Not only is that little knob a second foot peg, but we now have the reveal of a whole missile rack. As you can see, the missile rack itself is quite adjustable, but it doesn't really lock into any one place. You'd probably just want it to sort of be in the middle of the angles right here anyway. And it comes with six medium-sized missiles. And on the other side, two more foot pegs are revealed. One there, and one here, as well as an opening engine cover. Or at least that's what I'm thinking this thing is. As you can see, the engine down there is really quite small. It's actually in a very odd place, being on the side of the vehicle here. This is also quite deep in here, meaning that you could probably put a small pistol in there as storage. Now the designers could have just left this part as is, but they went the extra mile and actually added pull-out feet. So you just do like this, and they swing out and lock it to place fairly well, even with just friction. And now you can just plant this thing down and it's very stable. Even when you have the cannon all the way out like this, it doesn't tip over. And this is actually fairly nice. It's also fairly simple, kind of reminding me of the small place that we used to get in 84 and 85. As a matter of fact, it specifically reminds me of a 1986 Bell Station playset, the LAW or Laser Artillery Weapon, which I unfortunately have not reviewed yet. But it really reminds me of that, only this is more useful because not only do we have a seat here which could control the cannon if you want, but you can just have this whoever sitting here doing communications or radar. And thanks to the foot pegs on the base of this thing, we can have a second figure actually manning this cannon, meaning that this can accommodate two figures, whereas the 1986 LAW couldn't. Blocker, the Eliminator four-wheel drive Jeep driver, is only supposed to come with one accessory. What the contents list on the car calls an XL13 light refraction submachine laser. I'm not going to get into that. I'm, I'm just not. The XL13 is a very interesting design with this little loop here so you can hang it over one shoulder or around his elbow as this thing isn't very long. It also has a carry handle for, well, what is essentially a really big pistol. That's a very strange option. As well as very revolver-like grips on the otherwise very high-tech looking pistol. And now for a part of Blocker which is not mentioned on the contents list of this card, and that is his clear visor. I'm not sure if this is meant to be removable, but it's not glued in place either. Mysteriously, on the card artwork for Blocker, they actually haven't painted in the visor, but they did paint in the little holes for the sides of his hat. Now, most Battle Force 2000 figures at least came with two accessories, so Blocker only came with one. And here's the thing, only early versions of Blocker actually came with that visor. Most versions look like this, with no visor. And this isn't just a case of them removing a parts from the accessory lot. He literally does not have the holes for you to place a visor onto there. The removal of the visor is definitely a cheapening of the figure, because there's even more than that. Just like the Battle Force 2000 Avalanche figure, there's actually a paint app missing on the cheaper versions of the figure. On the back of the original visor-wearing blocker, on his wrist, you can actually see that there's red in between the brown on that one hand. However, on the cheap inversions with no visors, there is no paint app like that. And just like Avalanche, they phased out the original design of Blocker during the run of the single carded versions. So you will actually find both versions on the single card. But by the time the two packs came out, it was only the non-visor, non-red painted Blocker. The Eliminator Jeep is my favorite vehicle out of all the Battle Force 2000 series. So when I say that Blocker here is my favorite driver, it's not because of the Eliminator Jeep, but because of his own merits. I really just love the color scheme of this figure. 
Dark Gray really works really well with a lot of Joes, and Blocker here was no exception. He has a certain balance to him as well with all his detail. It's not symmetrical, but it's really, really balanced. And you don't really even notice how unsymmetrical this stuff is until you really take a good look at him. Now, as for the colors, he's using that same brown all over him. I really don't like how they did the camouflage on him uh, here, but at least it's continued on to his trim, unlike Avalanche, which just had that sort of brown splotchiness all over him. And speaking of details, he seems to have like little grenades here on the silver straps, which is really the only real pop of color on this guy. It's just on those shoulder straps, which is really nice. And like I said, it looks like he is symmetrical, but things like this bulge on his wrist here is not on the other side. Just like this, uh, this strange little front boot knife uh, shin guard thing. It looks like you could transfer that knife onto the other side or one or the other, depending on uh, which hand he wants to grab it from. But it's interesting that they just did not put the knife detail just symmetrically on the other side. One very interesting thing is just how much is kind of missing from the design on the card. It seems we actually lost quite a bit of paint apps from the original concept still seen in the card art to the figure in retail. And honestly, most of that was to the betterment of the figure. Here we have some brown detail which would have been on his shoulders and is just the left the plain dark gray plastic on the figure. And honestly, the less brown, the better. We have some silver detail around his head, as well as silver between the straps here. And again, that's a nice little pop of color, but we don't need it splattered all over the figure. I think making him the more subtle dark gray all over is really the better way of doing this. However, there is one sculpting change which kind of uh, went to the wayside here. We have some bullets coming down from underneath the shoulder strap here. Unfortunately, that's right where the elbow joint is, and I don't think you can really change that, at least not back in the uh, back in the 80s or 90s. And another unfortunate design change here is his camo is actually this kind of hard edge, kind of pseudo-digital camo that they tried to do in the 80s and didn't really perfect that until much later. But here, it's much more blotchy. It looks more like the sort of uh, natural type of uh, camo which is really unfortunate because, well, quite frankly, I really don't like this sort of thing in this sort of brown. Another paint app we lost, because we lost all of the red paint app, was the red in between the uh, straps on his knife holster there. If you're looking for an Eliminator Jeep or Blocker on the aftermarket, there's really only one thing you have to look out for. That is whether or not the Jeep has all six of its missiles. I find a lot of dealers who take photographs of this vehicle tend to only have it with the back portion covering up that thing. So if you're looking for one of these things online, you might want to ask whether or not it has all of its six missiles on there. Or if you see it at a toy show or a flea market or something, just take a little peek underneath there and see whether or not it has a full complement. But even if it doesn't, missiles like this and Basically, most parts for all the Battle Force 2000 vehicles and even the figures are really easy to find on the aftermarket and are usually dark cheap. Even the figure variant. Now, I know a lot of sellers actually used to up value this thing because it's pretty common for like a paint app variation to go for almost as much as the standard version. But sometimes when a figure has an accessory difference or a mold difference, that usually goes for quite a bit more. But in this case, the visor version of Blocker is just as easy to find as the one without. So honestly, you could probably save a lot of money just for being patient and looking out for one of these things at like a flea market or a toy show for dirt cheap.
stay tuned for next week for my final Battle Force 2000 review featuring the Future Fortress, DJ, and the Pulverizer.